Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct by construction, concurrent, scalable solution, our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative planet. Please join us on this journey. So welcome to this week's Climate and Coordination Rcast. Uh, we're very excited to be able to continue to do these calls each week, despite everything going on in the world right now. And um, today, I have a couple of different pieces of interesting news that I thought might be relevant. Um I'm not sure, maybe I'll, I'll start with the one that is more the climate piece, which I've just now put in the chat. This is a very interesting piece and I was reading it over and I got more excited the further I read. This is from The Guardian from April 1st. Um, I was searching and searching for a piece that would um, address this subject but really there wasn't one until april 1st so when i found it i was very happy and i'm confident it's not an april fool's joke i hope so um the headline from the guardian is will the coronavirus kill the oil industry and help save the climate uh sub headline analysts say the coronavirus and a savage price war means the oil and gas sector will never be the same again so there's a very interesting graph here, which shows the price of oil going just totally plummeting um, between basically uh, January, when the end of January, when parts of China were locked down until March 23rd, when the UK announced a lockdown. And um, there was a couple really interesting points in this that I thought were very fascinating um so hopefully um this well obviously this is already having a good impact on the climate right because we have way fewer planes in the air but um there are some people that were quoted in this article who believe that we've reached peak emissions um and we might maybe do another mini peak in 2022 but it's possible that we have already done that and also, uh, Canada has tried to bail out their uh, oil companies and said that they're on, quote, life support now. And now, apparently, there are uh, a number of wells around the world that ship, you know, millions of barrels of oil, big ones. And they are keeping the oil in the ground because the price of oil is lower right now than the cost to ship it which is also in the article. So we're in a very interesting situation here, and I don't think there's very many silver linings to this, but this article really lays out the economic case against oil, possibly forever. So this is really fascinating. Yeah, I remember, um, I think it was Bill McKibben, about a decade or more ago was was talking about the Canadian oil sands and and he basically said that if Canada extracts all the oil that's available in the oil sands projects in in Alberta um, that will be the end of the planet um, 
which means that um, what hit what hit me back then was that we actually have to um, solve this not not allowing peak oil to just happen we have to solve it through peak demand we have to actually change the norms of society so that we don't we leave that oil in the ground and um and what you just the article you just found basically says that that's what's happening um we've reached peak demand before we've reached peak oil and that is very encouraging news yeah, I, I don't know if the definition for peak oil and peak emissions is the same. I need to read more about that and see what it is. But anyway, there's no question that right now there really is no financial case for investing in fossil fuels. And also, you, they can't even sell them because they lose money by selling them. So it's just a really surprising turn. And I, I kind of, I mean, I knew that this was going to happen at some point, you know, but I didn't realize that this is already happening yesterday, you know? Yeah, it's amazing. Like the point when the oil becomes so cheap that it's, it's impractical to ship it, it becomes no longer financially viable. Yeah, and like I can just read one little paragraph from here if you want, but this is pretty interesting. What is beyond doubt is the carnage in the sector, the lowest oil prices for almost two decades, with worse potentially on the way. Some oil major stock market valuations halved, as in were cut in half since January, at least two thirds of annual investment, $130 billion, dumped, and tens of thousands of job losses. Well, that's a really bad situation, but... Hopefully they can find other jobs. In a few markets, prices have gone negative. Sellers will pay you to take the oil as global storage capacity fills. So it's just like, it's just crazy. Um, and obviously we don't want people to lose their jobs, but like we have this other green jobs and this goes into here talking about this uh, huge um, solar power station in Morocco, which is going to have, I guess, hundreds of, of thousands or possibly millions of solar panels, um, which is apparently nearing completion now. Uh, so obviously there are a lot of other opportunities and, you know, we don't have to go back into our discussion about the Green New Deal because we always talk about that, but now would be a great time. People are out of work and oil, the prices are shot. So, you know, it would be a great time to jumpstart a bunch of these green energy projects and get people working, you know? Yeah. And so, so, so this to me is just really fascinating in the sense that um, uh, if I remember the chronology, right, um, I think the price war began slightly before COVID kind of took off so it's kind of like this perfect storm yeah like in fact this article does actually describe that you're totally right so you know so the saudis and the russians came couldn't come to an agreement an opec meeting the saudis flood the market the price of oil shoots down then covid hits um so you know usually when the price of oil shoots down people start to consume more but because of COVID, they stopped consuming. So it was like a perfect storm for the for the oil industry, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. We're told we're definitely seeing conditions in a lot of different ways in our globalized society, cap mostly capitalist society, that are causing us to answer the question: What if? What didn't? Or what if? what was supposed to happen or what usually happens just didn't happen this time. You know, a lot of those things are being shut off or diverted. Just like you said, like when the price of oil shoots down, what if people just don't buy more because they're quarantined at home for months? Well, that's an interesting experiment. So 
Anyway, I'm a little bit inspired reading this, but there's another article that I thought might be interesting to share and maybe this is obvious. Maybe this is totally a scam. I have no idea, but that's why you guys are here to tell me to think about this. Um, this is from the Daily Hodel from March 31st. Um, and it says, PayPal evaluating blockchain use cases after CEO reveals he owns Bitcoin. So CEO of PayPal just announced that he had, uh, Dan Shulman just announced that he has, he owns Bitcoin, which is maybe not, um, big news because a lot of people own Bitcoin, but they are actually looking into hiring somebody to evaluate use cases to, for blockchain, for PayPal, that will prevent financial crimes such as terrorism and money laundering. So they're actually, they posted a job opening because they're looking for somebody who can do this. And um, they, I also learned reading this post, which is fascinating, that uh, in June of last year, it says here, PayPal joined Facebook's digital asset project Libra. However, it quickly changed course and withdrew from the Libra Consortium months later, becoming the first member to leave the, con the controversial project, which has faced backlash from regulators around the globe. Um, so they dropped out of this project and they said it's because they thought they could make more progress on financial inclusion by focusing on their own initiatives. So I'm curious to see what exactly they have, uh, the ideas that they have, because obviously PayPal is pretty innovative company and uh the ceo seems to be interested in blockchain at least on a surface level you know and peter, peter thiel left. was uh, sorry to interrupt but peter thiel oh, was um, was one of the founders of uh, paypal and um you know he got, he, he, he made he made a, uh, a killing and uh he set up a uh, the the thiel um fellowship right for for young entrepreneurs and vitalik was a theo fellow hmm. that's interesting yeah so, so there's, there's a long history of connection between paypal and uh, and blockchain it goes way back um i had no idea that paypal was ever even involved with that legal project i don't even know what the state of that is but i think it's probably a good sign that they left right because that seemed like a kind of bizarre situation it's kind of funny because because in the article he says something about how when they when they went to join libra and took a look under the hood um they saw that facebook had so much left to do to even just get off the ground that they were like uh why are we going to help you with your thing like let's just you know start our own it's kind of funny i mean that's why i think most people left like you know it was this big announcement and then you know one or two weeks later all these companies that were um, supposed to be part of the project you know started dropping off yeah that's you know it's so funny because we were talking to them right and we had a solution available to them but they, you know, like instead of availing themselves of, of technology that's way, way, way in advance of what they were even thinking about. <laughs> right. You know, it's really funny. Yeah. The other thing I find funny about the article is that um, the solutions that um, that PayPal is looking for in using blockchain is to um, prevent terrorism and money laundering. And those are all the things that the naysayers yeah. say that, you know, Bitcoin is all about, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Bitcoin, I was, I was thinking exactly that. I was thinking, wait a minute, Bitcoin is used in all of those activities. Yeah. <laughs> yep, pretty funny. <laughs> But again, it's another private blockchain initiative. Yeah, I mean, people don't seem to get the whole point about blockchain. It's like, why would I trust your blockchain any more than your database, right? If it's right. private, 
Right. And, and, and why would you make a blockchain? Because it's going to be many times slower than a, than a centralized database. <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if you're going to make it private, just use SQL Server. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy, right? It's just... <laughs> I mean, the our, our chain, uh, our chain's proposals in this regard are, are actually, you know, they're, they're sort of Trojan horse-like. You know, we propose that the reason you use a blockchain is because you've got divisions that are separated, right? So in, internal to your organization. So for example, you know, Santander has, you know, UK um, concerns and they have European concerns. And so, and, and they're, they're necessarily separate corporate entities and, and they have separate IT departments and all that stuff. And as a result, um, you know, they, they, um, they need, tools that kind of cross those boundaries and now now you have a reason for um, blockchain because you know you can't do the sql server across across the different concerns like that right uh, and so 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 now there's a reason for um for introducing something that is distributed and you know effectively decentralized even though it's decentralized under the auspices of a single um you know a business concern Right, but then once once they start doing into, uh, uh, sort of cross jurisdiction integration like that, then maybe they have another project that they also they use a use a shard to to do the cross cross jurisdictional integration with inside the company, and then maybe they notice that they want to do another cross uh, jurisdictional uh, integration thing within the company on another point, and then they realize oh it would be very valuable if we connected. Right, and so you slowly, from the inside of the company out, you piece together. It's like it's like a it's like a virus. <laughs> it eats the enterprise from the inside out. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. That was the design. <laughs> it's it's basically just the best the best system kind of eventually uh, changes the future in its own way. I don't know how to describe this right. Well, it's, you know, but the thing is that it's, it's, it's you know, I, I think about this a lot when I think about life, right? It has to be really, um, it's not just the best system, but it's, there's something about tenacity, right? I, I, I recently planted these seedlings, right? So I've got a bunch of broccoli seedlings and um, and tomato seedlings and pepper seedlings, um, and they're coming up. And I'm, I'm looking at these tiny, fragile little beings. Um, and, and life is like that. It's, it's super, super fragile. Um, but um, it's also incredibly fierce and robust, right? And think about the the robustness of <coughs> broccoli or tomato as as an overall species. It's it's incredible, right? They they, they found a way to to co-evolve with the humans, and so the humans keep them keep them going. <laughs> that's yeah, that's great. I'm I'm just absorbing what you just said there. It's it's I love the vision of like. The super fragile, gentle little seed by itself isn't isn't going to amount to much, but this whole ecosystem that evolved, and and like you say, it's almost as if the broccoli has its own intelligence and awareness, and it evolved um, because of humans. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a funny thing, right? I mean, it, from from the outside, if you didn't know in, any better, it would look like it was designed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I personally love broccoli. <laughs> yeah, I have a newfound love for broccoli because. Um, learned that it's a great source of soluble fiber which is what i i need because i have irritable bowel syndrome <laughs> so 
so I started eating broccoli like last week, like crazy. And <laughs> I've grown to love it. Too much information. Sorry about that. No, that's okay, Daryl. We're all very happy for your for your broccoli uh, usage. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, no, I I, 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 the thing about broccoli that's really interesting and in, in what I'm discovering more and more is there's just so many different kinds. I've recently discovered this um, very tender um, little broccoli that uh, um, it has a purple floweret. So it's green except it's a floweret where it's purple. And it's just gorgeous. And you, if you put it in a stir fry and you cook it just the right amount, right? So it'll be tender but a little bit crunchy. And the, the, the stems become this brilliant green and the, 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 the flower red is this deep purple. So it's, I mean, it, make, it makes the food look just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then if you listen to a nutritionist, they'll tell you that one of the best ways to eat healthy is to eat colorful. That's, that's one, one of the simplest ways to check, you know, to check and see if your diet is healthy. How colorful is your plate? Well, yes, and also I've read how rich are the colors because apparently a pale color vegetable doesn't have as many vitamins as a richly colored vegetable. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh yeah, there's like this nutrition book that I remember. Um, it was a kids' book for the, when our daughter was really young, and um, it's called "Today I Ate a Rainbow." That is so nice. <laughs> sounds like a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, is there anything else that we feel would be useful, important, apropos, inspiring, interesting, uplifting? <laughs> Um, Fiber has well, something I, to say. I, I can give just a little update. Uh, we're right now. We're um, I don't know if it if it will you know materialize, but we're we're uh, uh, Steve Ross Talbot is is talking uh, with Nabuko Yoshida about uh, possibly organizing some invited lectures at a high profile institution. So Mike Stay and Christian Williams and I were talking over what those lectures might include yesterday. Um, and I, uh, I took a bold step. I was reading a Quanta article about uh, um, this mathematical research institute called Oberwilfach. Um, it's it's in Germany, and it's you know up up on the side of the hill, deep in the forest. And the nearest town is Wulfach, um, and and it's you know on the hill above Wulfach, so it's Oberwilfach. I'd never heard of this research institute before, but apparently what they do is all year long, they organize these workshops, which are kind of like retreats because the research center is so remote. So mathematicians can kind of just focus on math. <laughs> um, and uh, I just on a whim, I looked up their, um, their schedule of, of workshops and they do have one on proof theory in November of this year. So. I took the, the bold step to find the, um, the organizers of the workshop and wrote to them, wrote to one of them, um, you know, talking about uh, the later results and seeing if they might uh, see fit to invite us to come out and, and speak, speak uh, with them about those results. That's really cool. Yeah. Who knows what will happen if they'll even read the email or if COVID will uh, permit it, but. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> Truly, who knows, but you know, you never know until you try or actually more apropos is you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely true. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm super excited about um, the work. I mean, we have, we still have lots of things that we, we need to think through, but um, the fact that we've got these uh, quite extensive proofs that are, um, you know, typing things the way they should is very, very encouraging.
we're we're way ahead of the way ahead of the game in terms of the Venus schedule. That that is so cool. That's awesome. Fantastic news, indeed. Um, well, uh, thank you, Greg, for your update. I'm so glad to hear all of this, and I hope that those people respond. You want to you wanna bring it out? You wanna well, sure, think? sure. Yeah, thank you, Greg and Daryl, for joining us today. Hopefully, we'll have a guest for next week's call. And um, if anybody would like to be a guest, they can email us at climate at rchain.coop. And please subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to become a member, you can also do that on rchain.coop. So thank you all for listening. And thank you. it was lovely, lovely to talk with both of you again. Agreed. All the best. All the Shelzers. Stay safe. Be well. Yeah, you too, Greg. <laughs>